Um, hi. Let's do this. And let me somehow kill the lights. I'm going to press something and it might explode. I don't know. I did. That's rather dark. Just imagine me. I'll try something else. Um, kinda. That's kind of the same. Anyway, I'll shut it off once I start doing something on the screen. Um, so my name, and I'll show you my name, otherwise you don't figure it out. That's my name. Which is rather hard to pronounce, I guess, although it's not that hard really. It's uh, Shurt Young. I work for Epic Games as Evangelist. I was here last year as well. In the past year, we pretty much took it a step further, so I'm, I'm doing quite a lot of this right now. I started working with Unreal in um, 1999, so I'm 16 years into Unreal. So I'm working for Epic 2003 and worked for them off and on. So what I'm going to do here today is, and I have a background, by the way, in level design, level art, tech art, um, you know, particles, lighting, cutscenes, anything in that direction, scripting. I'm not a programmer, though. So I'm going to talk from that perspective. And I'm going to build a simple 2D game live on stage. And then I'm going to round it off with uh, showing some general features as well. So the first part is probably going to take about half an hour or so, and then I'll round it off. This is probably going to run a little bit longer than the 45 minutes we have. It probably runs close to an hour. Okay, like the maximum time we have is an hour. I'm probably going to need that. And I'm going to say a lot, and I'm going to do this on speed. Okay? So it's going to wake you up, or the opposite. We'll see. Um, so I, I have quite a lot of steps. I have like 500 steps or so to go through, and I'm going to do all of them. I'm going to try to explain it as I do it, but I don't expect you to remember it. But the goal here is to give you an overview of what working with Unreal is like. Right? So by going through the whole process of setting all of these things up, I want to give you an overview of what Unreal is like. And I also want to use a couple more advanced features for some of you who might have used it. Um, who of you have used Unreal Engine 4? Let's start there. That's uh, reasonable. It's 40% or so, okay. Good, let me just start. Let's make it dark. Let's live in the darkness. Um, I'm gonna do a 2D game. You can see I have a basic level here. It's based on one of the samples you can download from us. I just modified it a bit to suit this. Um, and the first thing I need is I need to tell the engine what kind of game mode to use, because the game mode is the thing that controls everything else in a way, right? The game mode is what controls which kind of player there is, etc. So there's a couple of preparational steps I have to do here. I'm going to create a new game mode blueprint, so a new blueprint class based on game mode. Uh, my names are really bad, as usual, so just ignore. Don't take example of this very professional thing I'm typing. Um, I open that one up. And I make another blueprint, because I need a player as well. So I'm making a game mode and a player. Again, this is really just preparing a couple of steps here. And this one is based on stick base character. So it's a separate class. So basically, blueprint is a visual scripting language, but it's in embedded in everything in the entire engine. So there's a lot of things that are actually blueprint. I'll show you more of that later on. We're going to do a lot of that. So your understanding of what it is will come as we go through. So right now, let me just prepare some steps here. This is my player thing. Mistype as well, it's very good. Then uh, I'll make the game mode use my player. So here it says uh, default pawn class. That is the one I just made. Let's just do it like that. So that's assigned there. And in the level world settings, I'll tell it to use the game mode I just made. It's a rather small resolution. Let's do this. There we go. So now we just did the preparational steps. Now we can actually start working on our player. Uh, so this is the player. This is the player blueprint, right? So this is that one. And you can see here, it's empty. You have the, the capsule, which is the size of the player, but it's otherwise empty. You can also see on the left side, it says a couple of things are inherited. This came in from the parent class. When I picked the parent class, some of that stuff came in from it. So I already have a couple of things prepared here. And you can see in Sprite, it, uh, there's nothing here. See, there's none. So we can't see the Sprite because there's nothing there. So let me just uh, assign something there, like that, which looks very nice. So now we have that guy. So we're making a very simple paper 2D game of like this drawn stick figure, right? So I assigned this. And this is part of our 2D tool sets. We've embedded the 2D tool set a couple of months ago. And I can show you how this one was done. So this is already prepared. But what basically happened was this. We imported a, a texture like this. So this is a regular texture with the frames in. And then what we can do is we can right click that texture and we can do um, create sprite. 
or rather extract sprite even better. If you create a sprite, it will just turn it into a sprite. But if you do extract sprites, it will recognize where each frame is and it autom will automatically split it in this. See? So we have one sprite per frame. And that, then, once I've gotten all of those, I can right-click all of that and do create flipbook, which turns all of those sprites in an animation. So we have a basic sprite animation editor built in. Right, so again, now I've got this one. This has already been prepared for the different animations we have, run, jump, etc. But this is how you would go about it, and it goes quite fast. Okay, cool. Let's just play the game. It's done. So that doesn't really work, kind of. Like, at least we can spawn, but we can't really see anything. Uh, so our first problem would be that the camera is in the wrong position and wrong angle and all of those kind of things. There is no camera defined in here. If there is no camera defined, what we're getting is that it will take 0, 0, 0, which happens to be the arrow, basically. So you get this. That's our camera view. So by adding a camera to it, so I'm adding a new component, and I'm going to add a spring arm as well, because it's, uh, it makes things a bit better. Camera is a child of the spring arm. The spring arm basically handles the camera offset in an intelligent way. And we want to offset the, the camera from the character. Um, we've got that one set. I'm going to rotate it because the camera is actually should look at the character, not like this. It's a very small screen. Resolution, uh, sorry, it's minus 90, I think, like that. And this is the offset of the camera to the character. You can see the camera is over here now, and it's looking at the character, so that works. I will also turn off that it should inherit the rotation of the character because it shouldn't do that, it's a 2D game. And I'm turning off that it should do collision testing because we don't need that, it's a 2D game. Okay, that seems to work. By the way, what I'm not gonna do now, but what you could do if you wanna make a true 2D game, I'm, I'm gonna have 3D elements later, but if it were to be a true 2D game, you could set this, the camera, to orthographic, which I'm not doing now, but that would make it truly 2D. Okay, so that seems to work. Let's play this again. Okay, that works. We can see we have the character that we still can't move though, but we have the right view. Um, let's fix the, the movement. So it doesn't recognize the input from the keyboard. So we can't actually move. And this is where we start doing actual visual script, right? So Blueprint is our visual scripting system, but up until now, we're in the Blueprint and we haven't seen any, any actual visual script. So Blueprint also contains a lot of capped uh, components. It can contain particles, sounds, everything can be basically combined into it like a prefab. But then on top of that, we've got the actual visual script. So we've got this. Okay, so this is pretty much empty. We've got these three here, but that's just the fault stuff uh, to work from. So I'm gonna go to an empty location here, and I'm gonna get some input. Something has to happen to make things, uh, well, we need an event. So I'm gonna go for an event called move right. Going for an event called uh, uh, jump. Now I have two of them. And these two, they're actually defined. I can show you where they're defined. They're defined over here in, um, project settings, input, and here you can see jump, and you can see move right, etc. And here you can also see the jump has been assigned to W and up and A and D, etc. So here the keys are assigned to the actual actions, right? So you make these yourself. Okay, so that's uh, working. Um, so this captures the input of those keys, but then it still doesn't move the player. So what I'm gonna add here is an add movement input. So on press move right, which is both move right and move left. I mean, it's, it's two directions actually. Uh, we do add movement input one on X and the scale is the axis value. So the scale actually becomes minus one if you press left. Okay, cool, let's play that. So now I have this, which is still rather weird, but we have that. Uh, it's called jump by the way. Let's very quickly do the jump as well. It's very simple, it's just a uh, jump again. So we have a function called jump that's already embedded, that's already been set up in C++ underneath, so it just calls on that. Let me just very quickly do that again, but now we can move and we can jump. But it's still rather weird, right? It doesn't look very correct. The animation isn't updating, it's just playing the same animation over and over again. So let's handle the animation as next step. 
And here's a more advanced feature of Blueprint that I'm going to show. I'm going to show quite a few advanced features and it's probably going to be overwhelming because if you're new to it, you're probably going to say like, there's like lines and things everywhere, there's so many features. But ignore that aspect and the message I want you to take out from this is that Blueprint goes really, really far. It's not just placing some notes. We have serious support in here. We have a lot of depth in there, a lot of possibilities, a lot of power basically. So what I'm adding is an anim state, animation state actually. Animation state is a function. And I'm asking for that animation state every time I move. However, here's a special part of it. This thing, if I double click it, actually if I double click this, nothing happens, right? Because this has been made in C++. But if I double click this one, I get this. So I get another blueprint in turn. And you can see this is a rather large setup here. Uh, you can also see why I'm not building this live. It's too big to build, so I've prepared this. But what happens is that this has a parent class. And the parent class is a blueprint in itself. You can see it's located over here. So I've made one blueprint the child of another blueprint and by doing so I inherit the functions and the variables and all of the stuff that happens in the parent one in the child. So you can go quite far with that. In any case, what this one is doing is basically checking are you crouching, jumping, falling, firing, you know, what are you doing? And based on what you're doing, it will then output a different animation. Each of these, for example, this one represents the running animation, right? So it outputs a different animation set, flipbook, dependent on the situation you're in. Therefore, this output here, that is the new animation to use. So I'm, this basically figures out what animation to use. So I'm going to say the sprite, which is the one we're looking at. Set flipbook. And the flipbook to use is the one that the other one figured out. Good, let's try this. So you can see now we're actually running and when we jump we get an actual proper animation. The only problem is if I run left, I cannot go Michael Jackson backwards, <laughs> right? So we're still not quite there. So I'm going to go back here again and I'm going to take the axis value and I'm going to compare it. So compare float and I'll continue at the end there. Compare with zero because if no key is pressed, the axis is zero. If you move right, the axis is one. If you move left, the axis is minus one. So minus one or one, I can figure out if I'm going left or right, basically. So I'm using that compare here. Like this means you're going right, this means you're going left to uh, flip the character. So get controller, uh, get a controller and then set control rotation. This might be slightly confusing in the beginning, but it's a necessary step, so. Uh, make rod. So I'm basically setting the rotation of the character. So if you move right, the rotation is zero. We're not rotating the character. But if we move left, uh, then we move the character 180 degrees. So we flip him. So really just flipping the character. So let's try that. You can see now I get that. So it's pretty much playable. I have a basic, uh, basic dude who can run and jump. Actually, this is physics, so now I have Unreal on my head and it's kind of sticking there, yeah. So that works. Then, no game is complete without shooting things, so I'm gonna shoot stuff. So next step is I wanna be able to fire. So I can go back to the script here and I can do the next step, so okay, fire. It's a similar event as these, right? So it's just uh, an input action defined in the project settings and then it's linked to the keyboard buttons, etc. And then I'm gonna do, um, Spawn, uh, spawn actor from class. So I want to spawn something else every time you press it. I want to spawn like a, a projectile. And I want to spawn that uh, where the player is located. So the transform of the player. So I'm getting the transform, act, the location, rotation scale of self. And since self is the player, I'm simply getting location of the player, right? So that's cool. But the thing is, I don't have anything to shoot here, right? I need something there. We haven't made that. So I'm gonna leave this be for a second, and I'm gonna actually make the thing you're firing. So let's go here. Let's make another blueprint. You can see how everything is blueprint. Uh, I make another blueprint, and this is gonna be based on nothing, so it's just an actor. Um, project all the fire, terrible name again. Open that one up. And we have this. It's empty. This ball thing here is just a placeholder. It's just there to make sure it doesn't look empty, but it is actually empty. Um, so I'm gonna make sure that there is something here. So I'm adding a new component to it. 
So uh, sphere, sphere, collision. Sphere collision is just a collision in the shape of a sphere. I'll we'll make it a little bit smaller. And then this is invisible. I'll add something that is actually visible. So we'll add a flip book. So another animated sprite. And that one we set to, I believe that one. So now I have this one assigned, right? It's just a sprite and it has been set up in the same way. You can see this the animation is just four sprites playing. Okay, and then to make it more advanced, I guess we can add a, a particle to it as well and set the particle to uh, that. This will look better when it's moving. It's not moving right now, but if it flies, you have basically like small dots moving away from the projectile or staying behind rather. Okay, um, and then we need to make sure it behaves like projectiles. So I'll add a projectile movement to it. And in the projectile movement, so the projectile movement, and actually I haven't mentioned this on the player, but if you look in the player, we have character movement. And character movement has a lot of properties on how the player behaves. So here you can say how high the player can jump, how fast the player can run, if the player can swim, and all that. So we have a lot of properties here predefined to help you set that. Uh, and in the same way, by adding this other type of movement class to the projectile, projectile movement, we can set the speed and the direction and if the projectile is bouncing and all of that. So those projectile components are basically controlled by the movement, right? General. So speed, 2,500, say. And I'm going to set the gravity to zero, so the projectile goes in a straight line. And that should be that. Good, let's try this. Make sure we have it selected. Let's assign it there, which it doesn't always do, as it is. OK, let's play. OK, so that kind of works, but it kind of goes through everything. So at least we can fire. So that's something. Um, but yeah, it's going through everything, so that's maybe not ideal. So let's fix this then as next stage. Let's go back to the projectile. And the problem here is that the sphere, which is the actual collision of the thing, and you can see it's slightly offset. It would probably be better if it's there. But uh, that thing has overlap all set. It doesn't have block set. It's just overlapping. So I'm going to set the overlap to um, ignore only pawn. So block everything except the player. So it shouldn't hit the player, because that would be weird. If you're firing, it will hit yourself. So it's going to ignore the player, but it will hit everything else. OK, let's try that. So yeah, that's slightly better, but now we can have like that, which may be also weird. So it's sticking to everything. I could technically give this collision, by the way, and you could almost stand on it, which could be nice. You have a bridge building game something, but yeah, still not ideal. OK, so let's fix that then. Um, at this point, I'm going to start doing visual scripts to the projectile as well. So event graph, and I'm going to say, on event hit, when you hit something, you will, for example, destroy yourself, which is not ideal, but it will work for now. So see, there's a bit of lag in the beginning, but it's just first time. So every time I fire now, it just disappears. But that's still not very nice, right? It's OK, I'm going a step further than that. Um, spawn an image at location and then destroy yourself. Maybe that's better. So do that. Location where to spawn it is the location where you hit. So hit location is that. And the one to spawn is another particle. And basically we have then this. So now I have that, which is slightly better. At least you have a little impact splash because it plays this other particle, which is this explosion of blue stuff every time it hits something and then it destroys itself. So getting better. Um, problem still though, and this is another advanced feature. These blue blocks, they're supposed to be destroyable. So I'm supposed to be able to shoot them and they should get destroyed. And they're not doing that right now. So I want to fix that. Uh, for that, I need to figure out if that blue, what I'm hitting. I need to know if I'm hitting a blue block or something regular. So I'm going to take other here. Other is the thing you hit. So this is the object you're hitting. And I'm going to cast the other thing to a breakable brick before it gets destroyed, so in between here. And by casting it, it will either succeed, this is basically success, and this is failed. If it failed, it means it didn't hit a breakable brick because it failed to cast to it. Cast basically means interpret the result as a breakable brick, as that class. Breakable brick is a specific class. And if it fails to interpret it as that, it means it's not a breakable brick, so we're destroying it. 
But if it is a breakable brick, then I will tell that breakable brick thing to destroy this brick. And then still destroy yourself as well. So destroy the brick, then destroy the actual particle the projectile we're firing. And I will show you what this is in a second. Let me just first try this. And yeah, for some reason there's cats coming out. <laughs> Slight detail, and they're blue. But it worked, right? So it got destroyed, but everything else is still fine. And what we just did is following. If I double click this, I go here. See, it called on this thing. I'm now in the breakable brick. I can show you, in fact, if I go back to the viewport and I click on one of these things and I do like right click edit breakable brick, because this is a blueprint as well. You can see it's that one there. If I edit this one, see, we get the same view. So in that blueprint, there is a certain function or an event, in this case an event, and we're calling on that one. So when this one gets hit, this one will fire this event, which then in turn, this thing is the spawning of the cat and the destruction of the block. So we can really do communication from one blueprint to another blueprint, it's quite straightforward. Um, good, so now we have blue cat things that break, I don't know, stuff. Let's go even further because no game is complete without UFO, so I need aliens and UFOs. So I'm gonna add an, a UFO, which is a 3D mesh, and the serious part of this is that I can add uh, a material to it. So I wanna do a little bit of material editing here as well, so we're not just doing uh, blueprints. So. Let's set up the, the basic stuff first of that UFO, and then I'm gonna leave Blueprint behind for a second, go to the Material Editor. Okay, so a new Blueprint class again. Again, based on nothing, based on actor. And it's uh, gonna have another very great name of UFO something, literally. Open it up, again, it's empty. Just doing a few preparational steps. Adding a scene to it, which is just a dummy object. And then more importantly, adding a model to it. So this is the static mesh. And that static mesh is this. So we simply have a blueprint with a model in it. That's all we've really done. You can see we have a simple UFO model here, something like this, but it has no material. This is the default texture. So I'm gonna make that. So I'm leaving this behind for a second. Let me just save it. I right click, create new material. Um, I'm gonna call that uh, UFO parent or something. Open that one up. And then you can see the, the, um, the material editor, and you can see it's the same kind of interface. And that's a very important thing of a real life thing that I'll get back to later on. So we have all of this, we'll add a texture to it. And we'll set that texture to the UFO texture, which is uh, that. So basically, this texture has already been imported. It's super simple, it's really just three colors. But it's an extremely simple texture. Um, so we have the texture in the material now, connected to base color. See, now we have the, the texture there, it's quite straightforward. Then it's all PBR, so it's physical based rendering. So we have metallic specular roughness. If I set roughness to zero, I have real time reflections and everything. Not sure if you can see it on the projector, but it has a bit of clouds rendering through. In the game, it will actually not render the clouds, but the actual surrounding environment, right? And then we'll make it next gen by adding Fresnel to it, which is connected to emissive. And then you have that rim lighting on it. So it's totally modern, good. Okay, so that works. Um, fine, let's save that and let's assign it and see what happens. So if we assign this, you can see I have two material slots here I've just added, and I assign it. That works fine. I mean, it's not the best material ever, and best texture ever, but it works. But the problem is the bottom doesn't have a material. The UFO actually has two different material uh, slots and it needs two different textures. The bottom has a different texture, right? What I could do is I could just duplicate it. I could do this again for the other texture, but that wouldn't be great. Um, so I'm gonna use a more advanced feature of Unreal. So I'm gonna right click this and I'm gonna convert it to a parameter. Basically, I'm gonna make a child of this material, which has a, needs a certain name, so I'll simply call it texture. And just for the sake of example, I can make the roughness a parameter as well. So I can convert the number here to uh, a parameter and call it roughness. And then um, save that again. What I can do then is right click the material, create material instance. So I'm gonna make an instance from it. And that instance, see it has a simplified interface it exposes the things you've added, right? So everything that's a parameter will be exposed, everything else is hidden. So now I can simply change the texture here 
in the blue texture, this is the other texture we're using, uh, without changing the parent, but if I change something here, this one will change as well, right? So we have this whole hierarchy. And you can keep on doing this. You can make one instance the child of another instance, which is the child of another instance. Not only that, you can take it even further than that. Um, because what the UFO has at the bottom here, there's supposed to be blue, bloomy something, something blue there, right? And that has been prepared with vertex colors in the mesh. So everything that has black vertex color is supposed to be blue. That's what I want to do. And I can do this here already. I should do it over here. Um, so I could be doing something here like add, you know, and then I can build an entire setup here, which I'm not going to do to save time, like, you know, use the vertex color and then add in blue and all that. But there's an even better way, which is following. So now I've dragged this one in. And this thing, I'm going to add that one instead. And when I save it, and assign the material to the UFO. So when I assign uh, that one here, you can see we have this bloomy animated thing here at the bottom. See, so that works. So that, all, that whole thing just did that. And what I just did actually is if I double click this, we have the same like blueprint. We actually open up a network of other things. So we even have these things collapsing in blocks ourselves. You can make one of these blocks yourselves using other blocks. And that has been saved externally in another folder. So you can go super far actually with this. You can have a lot of different layers of stuff underneath each other. You can have layered materials. You can go a lot in a lot of different directions. And the point I'm trying to make with that is that there's other engines with material editors and all that. But we've had a material editor since 2006. And we've built in a lot of features in there that go a lot further than simply dragging lines and you know, like connecting blocks and that's it. We have a, it's, it's a very mature tool basically. And this shows that. Good, so the material is done. Let's stick to that. Um, UFO is there. Let's just actually just add the UFO to the level for a second. So I'll just drag it in and I'll set uh, the Y location to zero because the world is on, on zero. Move it up. So we have something like that. Okay, so we have a UFO here, but it doesn't fly. If I play this, it's not gonna move. So I'm going to do a very basic path. I just want it to move back and forth between two points. And then once I have that covered, I need something on top of it. I'll show you that later. And I want it to drop bombs. So I need to do some basic attack stuff. Um, OK, so event graph. I get the UFO, because this is the UFO. That's the model representing the UFO. And I'm going to tell that one to set your relative location. Um, and I want to lure between two points. Right, so basically I want to go back and forth between this location and this location all the time. And let's say that this is 1,500. So I want to go back and forth between two points. These are my two points in the world. And it's going to go back and forth with alpha. In other words, I want to animate the alpha. So I need something there that animates it. Okay, so let's do like this. Um, add a timeline. And do that over there. So if it updates, it will update the location. Um, and I double click the timeline. And if I double click it, I get our curve editor. You can see the length of the animation is five seconds. And I can add something to it. There's nothing here, but if I press this button here, I add a flow track for which we need three points. So we're basically animating a value, right? So we're just animating a number using a curve. So the first one starts at zero and value is zero. The second one starts at uh, uh, or is located rather at two and a half, so halfway the five seconds we have, and the value is one, and the third point is at the end, so at five seconds the value is zero again. In other words, we have that. It moves from point A to point B, and back from point B to point A, and I enable loop at the top, so it's just gonna go back and forth all the time. Okay, by having added this one, you can see new track underscore zero, it has shown up over here, and that has become the alpha of my lerp. So that seems to work. The only thing is it doesn't start playing. So I'll take a begin play. When the game starts, play that. So a basic, uh, basic setup there. Let's see what happens. Right, so that, that thing works. It goes back and forth. It's a very simple enemy, but it kind of works. And then I would like this to uh, fire something. So next step. Uh, you could do this, in, do this in a better way than I'm going to do it, but for the sake of saving time, I'll do it in a very simplistic way. As it updates, 
it has a one second delay each time before it takes the next step. So there's one second delay between each projectile. And then it's basically the same as, sorry, I keep typing actor uh, projectile from Unlegend Engine 3. So confused there after all this time. Uh, I do the same as I did with the other one. All right, so this is pretty straightforward. So they get to the transform of the static mesh and I spawn an actor. Okay, so I could do that and it would work. In fact, I can uh, uh, show you if I find the right one back that I prepared. But there is a better way that I'm gonna do in a second. In fact, I can probably do the, the better way right away. Uh, show you how that one works. So I could do this, it, it will work just fine. I've already made a blueprint for this. But let's not do that actually. Let's just get rid of that. And let's go back to here and add a new component. And this is again an advanced feature of Blueprint. So a new component called an attack component. And that attack component, I have it located in here. I'm and then going back to the script, I pull in the attack component I just made. So this thing represents that in my list of components. And I ask that one to attack. Uh, Okay, I click correctly. Uh, the attack function on it. In fact, I can do it like this, but this is more confusing for you. So let's do uh, do that one. So you can see the line in between. Right. So this thing has a function in it, and I'm asking it to attack. And when I play like this, you will get that. So for some reason, it also drops cats, and these explode. I like cats, by the way. I have nothing against cats, but they just tend to explode. <laughs> Um, so what happened in the attack function that I have been calling is following. Uh, the component here is a blueprint in itself. Again, so again, it gets quite complex. So if you're new to, it, new to this, this might be quite overwhelming. But the point is, this is a blueprint in itself, right? So I can open that one up and I can show you where it's coming from. This is that. So this is a component blueprint. There's nothing in here. There isn't even a viewport. There's no components in here either. But there is a function here called attack function. And that one does the same. You see spawn actor, make transform, play a sound, and play a spawn a particle where it spawns. So that basically has been located in here. So you can really split this up. You can really like divide the work between, between people in your team or organize it in a very nice way. There's a lot of more advanced parts of Blueprint. Good. Um, let me continue to the next part. Good, so now we have most of this working. I'm gonna run to the end of the level where there are some slides. So I can show you that. So I'll use Epic as a base to get over this wall because I kinda need to get to the other side. I don't get killed, by the way, by the cats because that would have been a bit harsh for the presentation, but we have a lot of cats, though. Good, so. Just have to run over here and then the next platform. Um, right. So then the actual regular part. You all understood kind of the steps I did? Kind of worked out? Yeah, good. So I think a big part of Unreal and, and really or, or approach basically since day one. So we started the engine like um, around 1996, 1997 or so as far as I'm aware. and. It's been a very long time. I mean, we've been working on Unreal for a very long time. We've got to gain a lot of experience doing this. And a key thing of Unreal has always been the sub-editors. So we have about 10, 11 sub-editors built in. And we don't want to have, I mean, we think it's really nice if people make plugins and such. And we'd love if people make plugins. But we don't think people should make plugins for like a material editor. So that should be our job. We're making the engine. And by doing so, we make what we end up with is a very consistent approach to the editor. You can see they all kind of look the same. They all have the same approach. They have all of the same workflow. If you know one of them, it's quite easy to get into the other ones because they, you have to think the same way. And that's a big plus for us. Um, it also is a big plus that this stuff works on every platform. It works in every version. If you go work for a company or you hire someone into your company, it's, they know the exact same tools. They don't know other tools or other approaches. They know the exact same tools. It's very easy to get people up and running. Um, and also because they're all made by us, ourselves, we make sure that they all work together. I can very easily make the material editor talk to Blueprint and make Blueprint talk to the UI editor and everything else, like the interface editor. Everything talks to each other. You don't have to go to like some, you don't have to go to script first or anything else. Everything talks to each other. They're all made for each other and I think that's a big plus. Then what we have, let's go to the next one. 
um, we have the, the templates. So if you create a new project, we have templates built in. And the templates we have for C++ and Blueprints. And we have a lot of things like vehicle games or twin stick shooters or you know, puzzle games or so. It basically generates the whole thing. And from there on out you can do prototyping on what you want to try, etc. But it's very good for learning as well because it generates it. You can pretty much see how it should have been made to make it work. So we have that. And we have, um, we've got our example scenes. So all of this stuff you can download. We have more than this. This is just a selection of it. All of this you can download. Uh, any stuff in there that you want to use, you can use. So you can look at how we've made it to learn from it. If you like a tree in there, or you like the castle in there or something, you know, and you want to make a game of your own, you can use our castle. If you want to sell the game, it's fine. Even if it's a commercial project, it's totally fine. Um, so anything we're releasing, you can look at how we make it, and you can uh, use it. And some of it is very high-end AAA content, like the cutscene stuff at the very top left. That's very high-end stuff, and you can look at how we've done it. So you have a lot of nice examples there. Then we have cats. Um, we also have a marketplace. We're still building that one out. We'll very soon have code support for it. Uh, so right now it's content only, but we'll soon have plugins and such on there as well. Um, we also take, uh, we have our own approach here. So basically we're checking everything that gets submitted gets checked by us rather thoroughly. And we will check if you use our naming convention, if the sizes are correct, if it has collision, if it has light maps, if everything is technically correct. We basically want to make sure that what you buy here, what you get from the, from the store, works properly and is technically correct. Okay, so we're rather strict there to ensure quality. So we've got that one. Then the entire source code is released. So you can just get the entire source code, even the editor, every single thing we've done is out there. If you want to make the editor pink, you will make the editor pink. In fact, you can then send what you've done back to us. It's on GitHub, by the way. So you can do a request for us to take in your change. And if we feel that your change is better for everyone, we will uh, implement it into the standard engine. So if we feel that doing the editor in pink is better, we will do a pink editor, okay? So you can really, you can submit what you've done to us and we'll take it in. Or we can work with other people in the community. And also the big thing here is, is if ever there is a bug in the engine, we will fix it. Um, we're definitely going to fix it, but if we're not fast enough, because we're a bigger organization, things take a bit of time for us to, to get things out, then you can always fix it yourself. It can never block your, your production, right? And that's, rather, that's a big point as well, I would say. Okay, then actually I wouldn't need internet. These are actually internet here that I can easily use. Yeah. Any idea? Yeah. The cable? Um, Probably need light. <laughs> or I think that you could, well, it's just Wi Fi, I think. Okay. Wi Fi? Yeah. One second, sorry. Which one? Uh, Android one, can I? That one, yeah. Yeah. You can take my password. <laughs> I think you need a login. Hmm. That works. So. Okay. Yeah, good. Yeah. That was easy. Okay, so we've got a lot of different channels. I mean, we have our, our homepage, obviously, straightforward. We have the official documentation. Most of it has been documented. Obviously, there might be a few small things left and right that we're working on, but most of it is there. Um, we've got the forums, straightforward, in our forums. We've got the wiki, more, it's more community run. Uh, we've got the answer up, that's the stuff we're using. So here you can report bugs, ask questions, the developers will get back to you there. Uh, we've got YouTube, we have 208 videos there. I don't know how many hours, but it's a lot of hours and it's a lot of tutorials. So we have pretty much everything tutorialized on YouTube. It's all free, obviously. And we've got then the more special things. We've got Twitch every Thursday evening, eight o'clock our time. So every Thursday, we have a live broadcast from North Carolina, from the headquarters there, with the actual developers of the engine, and they will just talk for an hour, two hours or so live on what we're doing right now. So if we're working on making some kind of tree system, we're gonna tell you, right? We, re we really wanna be open with people, we'll just tell you. And you can chat with us, so you can just ask a question, when will there be pink trees? And we will say never, okay? So, or maybe tomorrow, I don't know, but. Um, so we've got that, and um, we've got the entire roadmap up for quite a long time already. And it's rather large. 
you know, this is for the next couple of months, and you can kind of see what we are prioritizing, what we are working on. So we're trying to be really open, because if you're going to make a game with, with our engine, you have to kind of know what's going to happen, right? You have to understand where we're moving forward with the engine and what we're doing. So we really want to share that information with you. Um, and then I love doing this every single time. So then you have this. And I'm going to scroll through this. No, I'll have to take a seat for that. You'll see. So this is one of our releases, and I'm just going to scroll. Kind of tells a story, gets the point across. So. And the resolution is quite small, so this will take uh, extra time. <laughs> Yeah, we're there. Okay, that's one release. You're getting the point? <laughs> so this is how fast we're moving and, and, and what our development velocity is basically, how fast we're fixing things, how fast we're improving things. And you know, just seven weeks after we've did, done this one, we did this, and I'm not gonna scroll through it again, but you're getting the point. This is just seven weeks later and we've done the same thing again. So that's how fast we're on top of things. So if there is something wrong, we are really gonna get to it. And we're also adding major new features. Obviously, some of these are just bugs and things to fix, but you know, in this release, for example, we did uh, uh, hot reloading for C++, and we did a better vehicle setup over there, and we did a UI editor was added. So I mean, there are major tools being added, and seven, week la seven weeks later, we do the same thing again. So that's our speed. Um, yes. Let's go back here. So that's pretty much all of those things I just said. So do this. Then it runs on pretty much everything. It doesn't run on Windows Phone. And um, also Nintendo is not something we support. But it runs on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Windows, Mac, uh, Linux, and iOS, mobile in general. It runs on Oculus, by the way, and Gear VR. It runs on Morpheus, you know, all of that. The, the, the VR stuff in general works really well for us. We have a close cooperation with uh, Oculus. And... Um, there's a reason why most of those major demos are unreal. So we pretty much support all of that. In fact, you can run the editor on Mac nowadays as well. You can run the editor on Linux. Um, you can deploy an iOS the game to an iPad, for example, from a Windows computer. So you can even just use a Windows computer, connect to an iPad, and it will deploy the game to it, etc. So we have all of that. Then, what a fun one. We have this one as well. We've got the Dev Grant, so we're going to give $5 million away to people doing stuff, okay? That kind of describes it. So if you do something cool with Unreal, uh, and you'll send it in to us, and we like what we're seeing, we're gonna give you money. And if, that's it, there's no strings attached. You don't have to pay it back. If the game never gets released or whatever happens, you know, something might, might go wrong, you don't have to pay it back either. It's not a loan, it's really just us giving you money. There's no strings attached. And it doesn't even have to be a game. If you do something cool with architecture or you do like a commercial in Unreal, I don't know, you do an educational project, anything goes, anything that's cool, we will give you money. So, so far in the past two months or seven weeks or whatever it is, we've given away something like $220,000 if I recall correctly. So, we're doing that. There is no time frame, by the way. We, we haven't set an end date for this. We haven't set any deadlines. It's really an ongoing thing. So you submit it whenever you're ready. If you feel in a year from now you're ready, you just submit it in a year from now. If you feel like you want to resubmit it, you just resubmit it. Okay, so there's no maximum times you can submit. There's no time frame. It's really very relaxed and very informal, I would say. Good, and before I do the next one, actually, we should probably get light at some point. Be careful, light will appear. It will burn you. Um, how many of you know ah, that was a microphone. How many of you know what this costs? What would this cost? Do you know the pricing of this? So that's like ten percent I guess. Um, yeah, so the cost of this is nothing, it's free. Okay, so all of the stuff you just saw is just free. Uh, it's free to use, it's free to mess with it, it's free to use in education, it's all completely open for you. If you make a game with it and you sell the game, then there is a 5% royalty on it. Okay? But that's when you start selling the game. 
If you do anything else with the engine, like you do architectural visualization, it's completely free. There isn't even 5% on it. If you do like a, a, a training simulator for a company or something, it's completely free as well, etc. So it's very flexible. And what you're getting is the exact same thing everyone else gets. So we don't have different versions. We don't have scaled down versions. It's exactly the same. You get, ex you get the source code, you get everything. Okay, so it's really, really flexible. Good. That's quite on time, actually. I'm getting fast. Did you manage to follow a bit? We've got some time for some questions for about five minutes or so. So if anyone has questions, we might need a mic. Yep. Yeah. Like, I know you can code in C++ with like uh, Unreal, but I know so far you use like Visual Studio. But will there be support so we can use other environments coding in C++? As far as I'm aware, not for the time being, no. At least not officially from us. I mean, maybe someone in the community or someone does something. But as far as I know, we're not going to do that, no. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, you can pick. <laughs> Uh, this is kind of a follow-up question. Mm. Uh, do you know anything more about the whole Visual Studio for UE4 thing that we talked about recently? I've, I've seen some news posts about some kind of yeah. free version that's, that's be, that could be delivered with the engine. Do you know more about that? I, I know what you mean, but I don't know any specific details worth mentioning. <laughs> so, no. But the information is online. It's all on the website. It's the same deal for Unity. It's the same deal for some other platforms. So. Uh, the the blueprints and the visual scripting looks great, and, but I can see that they can get quite complex. Do you have any sort of tools that help with debugging these visual scripts? Um, yeah, I can very quickly do something here. Um, first of all, you can see it running in real time, by the way. So the game is running right now. But then again, this is, this is a very simple script, but you can see it running as the game runs. So you can see the values as well as it executes. You can see what kind of path the thing takes and when it gets to something. You can add breakpoints to that as well, etc. So A, you've got that. Um, and I mean, you can do a lot of other things. You can add the debug messages to it and all that. So it's actually quite, quite easy to understand what goes wrong. And if it goes wrong, by the way, you'll get an error. The script, that script won't work anymore, but everything else of the game will still work. It's not like it can crash the engine by doing something wrong in Blueprint. Everything will still work, but you might get an error somewhere. So it's quite stable, I would say. And, and by the way, when something goes wrong, you get a text. You even get a link in the error message. If you click on the link, you'll actually go directly in the visual script where the problem is located. And the blocks that are wrong are marked red error and such. So it's quite easy to pinpoint where the problems have been situated. So. Any other questions? <laughs> Do you use the IRC channel? Yeah, I'm on the IRC channel. What's your nickname? Arensis. <laughs> oh, actually, I should show my name, by the way, yeah. Well, I'll show you. It's my beautiful platform, and then that. <laughs> so, yeah. You mean the, the big one, right? The biggest one, the free node? I think it's free node? Yeah. Yeah, no. yeah I'm on there. I'm sure I've actually talked to you before. Okay, good. <laughs> Okay, any other questions? Nope. Okay, cool, awesome, thank you.